Um, well, first of all, it's, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. When you're thinking about this subject, like any good um, teacher will tell a teenager as they're learning to write essays, it's what do we actually mean by liberal democracy? And I think it's important not to, to give you just a broad definition at the beginning, just to talk about, you know, just to set out what I mean by it, because I think without that, it's hard to, to move on and move through. So, so basically what I mean is you should break this down into two bits. You've got the liberal bit and you've got the democratic bit. The liberal bit is that there is an acceptance of freedom within constitutional limits for individuals. That is, I think, the core bit of the liberal bit. The democratic bit is not just that majorities rule, because you could call that mob rule in one sense, but that there are protections and an acceptance that minorities also have views and interests that need to be protected. That's the difference between you know, a, a quasi-democracy where if you're in a minority, you get trampled on because you're, you're a minority, and a true democracy, which is minorities matter because they have intrinsic sort of inherent uh, value uh, and that, I happen to think, comes from a sort of Judeo-Christian tradition of each and in every individual is made, in, you know, is made in God's image. And I'm not saying that because everybody needs to believe that from a religious perspective. But I think historically that's where we have come from. That's where we've built his liberal democracy around. But there is a third aspect to liberal democracy that I think is important to state at the beginning. And that is, it is capitalist. You know, it is not a communist system. It is not a sort of more like fascist economic model. It is a democratic capitalist system. And it is important that we remember that that is an integral part of liberal democracy as well. So we've got to first of all set out that it is under threat. It's under threat, in my judgment, from, from two sources. Broadly speaking, from above and below. Where is it from? Uh, from under threat from above. How is that? In several ways. The first is it's under, it's under threat internationally. It's under threat internationally because there are major global actors, and I put China as the number one in this, that fundamentally disagrees with this model. Even their version of capitalism isn't the same. They call it sort of state capitalism. It's a different way of ordering society. And they are being very successful. You know, you can't, you can't pick up a newspaper without people saying, you know, China are doing this, they're doing that, they're taking millions of people out of poverty every year, the Chinese growth rate's at 7% or whatever it is. You know, so they are appearing pretty successful. And a lot of places in the world are looking to China thinking, that looks like quite a good way of, of organising things. So it, it is under threat from examples elsewhere, from above. It is also under threat in broad terms from a lot of countries within the West. And I use the United States as one example, but it's under threat because there are many people within the West who look at the model that we currently have, and again, I think this has an economic root often, but it's also social in terms of immigration, which combines with the, the economic. They look at this and think, maybe, this isn't the right system. They don't necessarily want the Chinese system, but they say, well, maybe the way we're doing things isn't so great. And then they, they say the reason for that, because their life isn't so great, or um, they believe they can't get on in life, or they can't buy a house, or they believe there are too many immigrants in their village, or whatever, whatever the, the, the concern is. And the third way in which I believe it's under threat from above, and this is again where the United States is pivotal, and there's a bit of a theme here, is the rules-based international order that has prevailed, broadly speaking, since the Second World War is no longer working properly because the Americans are failing to defend it. Britain and Europe are sort of going through a few issues at the moment. <laughs> Europe itself, even if you take Brexit out, is actually divided in many different ways. And whether it is the United Nations, whether it's NATO, whether it is even the World Trade Organization <coughs> that many of my colleagues have a lot of faith in, actually, the World Trade Organization very soon is about to run out of judges to adjudicate disputes. I don't know if this is commonly known. The Americans have failed to sign, uh, sign off 
judges for the last couple of years, which means that even the World Trade Organization soon is in danger of not being able to operate properly. The whole way in which we've governed things since the Second World War is under threat. So in one sense, so I think it's under threat from above. It's also under threat from below. And this is something that, in fact, I was speaking at a panel um, an hour ago, and I feel very, very strongly. The impact of technology is only slowly becoming apparent. The impact of technology, and with that I mean big tech, and with that I mean mass data, and with that I mean the fact that you can live in your own digital echo chamber. To some degree you regard that as quite funny. We all say, well, you know, on my Facebook feed, everybody voted Remain, or on my Facebook feed, everybody voted Brexit. Now we sort of, we learn to live with that, we find it quite amusing, but I actually think it is the most pernicious thing that is affecting our democracy now, because you no longer need to think about people who do not agree with you. I'm 33, grand old age, I know. And when I, even 10 years ago, smartphones did not exist. That we, Facebook was in its infancy. You didn't get news from Facebook 10 years ago. There, you did search on Google, but you didn't have that personal relationship with ideas that you have now through your smartphone. And as a local MP, I can tell you, it is the most dismaying thing in the world when somebody says to me there's something that's completely bonkers, and then they say, but don't worry, I read it on Facebook. And what you realize, and I'm not actually, I'm not sort of per se beating up on Facebook. I know that you know, it's, it's one company. It's, it's more what they represent and what they are part of. And so if you have a system whereby you no longer have to engage with, in a proper level, views that you disagree with. You no longer start to respect the rights of minorities or what you perceive to be minorities on that particular subject. And when that happens, guess what? You quite quickly get to quite an illiberal view. And let me give you a very current example. Now look, I'm a, I'm a conservative, and I'm a conservative for many reasons, but one of them is that I believe in the value of our institutions. I believe in the value of parliament, the court system, the monarchy. I believe in that, and I believe they need to be defended. And I thought that was what all conservatives believed in too. And yet, sometimes, and I can't see why you're laughing, I can't see what you're, what you're thinking, of, <laughs> but sometimes people who I would regard as conservative to their absolute, you know, in their DNA, they will say, well, the courts, you know, they're all lefties, you know, we can just ignore them all. Or whether it comes to, you know, something to do with even the monarchy, they may criticize if it's in something else. Or parliament, well, I mean, it doesn't really matter. What matters is the vote of the majority. And parliament doesn't really matter because that is less important than the vote of the majority because that is what the people have said. Then you get to a place where your whole liberal democratic system no longer works in the way in which it was designed to work. So my broad sense is it is being attacked from above and also attacked from below in a bottom-up way. As an aside, I might just say, because I was thinking about this, and I'm a little bit obsessed with this idea, so I don't even know if this makes, it makes sense to even include in this part in my, in my talk. But Newspapers, I was looking up the history of newspapers and what politicians did when newspapers came around. They hated them. They banned them for the best part of 50 years and even when they legalized them, they imposed a tax on them to stop people reading them. And so the only people who could read them were the rich people and there weren't enough of them to sort of make a fundamental difference in, in democracy. The reason why, and that was sort of late 17th century, I think the tax on newspapers came in in 1711, 1710, something like that. Now the reason why I say that is, we have been through things in the past where we've had new technologies come on board and we've managed to deal with them. So, and this is where I talked about the solutions and the happy things, okay? We've dealt with problems before where we've got a new technology that has come in that those in power thought had ruined everything. You know, you're, a, you're an MP for, a, you know, old Serum or wherever. And you'd go back to see your electors and there was some guy with a printing press saying all sorts of stuff about you and handing it around to people. You can imagine the shock that that gave a 17th century political system. But over time, now we regard newspapers as perfectly normal within our democratic framework. So what I'm saying is, when it comes to technology, I don't believe, I'm not one of those people that believe there is inexorably, we're leading to doom and dis destruction. I don't believe that. 
I believe that where there is political will, and political will comes from people will, you can change anything in this world. And I fundamentally believe that, because if I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be in politics. So this leads me on to my sort of last section as to what can we do about it and, and, and how do I think it should be changed. So what can we do? To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.